Yes, I think it would be wonderful to start. And it is exciting to see how many folks have joined us today. So please, Henrik. Okay, so then the more official hello and uh, good day, I might say. I wonder who has the most inconvenient <laughs> uh, time for joining this meeting. For for me, it's uh, it's very convenient because we're in the sort of in the in the in the afternoon here. I'm uh, Henrik Normark from the Volvo Research and Educational Foundations. Um, we are located in Gothenburg, and today I'm actually in Gothenburg, which is rather unusual because uh, I don't live here. But uh, it's such a pleasure to uh, see all of you and welcome you to this uh, launching event <clears throat> for the in International Research Program on Informal and Shared Mobility in Low- and Middle-Income Countries. Um, just a few words about the background here. Uh, the definitely quite a few more people uh, who can who can uh, say much more about informal and shared mobility than i can so i will just dwell on on the um, the history of this how it came about um, uh, and from vrf um, perspective um, so uh, we, we had a process uh, actually it's a few years back now where we were supposed to identify new themes for the VREF research and educational support. Um, so we had a consultative process over more than one year. And then the, we had somewhere between 10 and 15 different themes. And <clears throat> at the time, it was called Paratransit, uh, was selected as one of, of uh, two new themes, along with walking as a mode of transport. So we started then preparatory work to elaborate the focus and the modalities of, of the initiative. Uh, and along the way, it was changed from paratransit to informal and shared mobility. And well, there's always a debate about that. And there are so many uh, um, the, about the terminology, I mean, and, and the wording. But so we just had to take a decision and we settled for informal and shared mobility uh, as the theme. <clears throat> Um, and and the, the program as such started in 2022. Uh, and then one of the major uh, components of the program is uh, the international research program. So about one and a half years ago, we started a process to establish that with a call for expressions of interest uh, among uh, a good number of proposals. We selected four proposals or four expressions of interest um, who were awarded planning grants uh, and invited to develop a full proposal. Full proposals were produced and submitted um, in, in the first quarter of 2023. And then after uh, an external and internal review process, the VRAF board decided in June uh, on this uh, proposal uh, this consortium uh, with their proposal, but the competition was very hard. It was a very tough competition. So some of you represent other uh, teams or, or consortia uh, submitting proposals. Uh, it was a close uh, race, I can tell you. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so here we are. Uh, there was a contract negotiation process which ended in early October. We signed the contracts and uh, by then, then the uh, the IRP, as we uh, call it, the International Research Program IRP ISM, was ready to to go, um, <clears throat> and uh, just uh, excuses from Holger Dalkman, who was supposed to be here. He's the coordinator of the ISM program at VRF. He's also a strategic advisor. He has a very tough cold today, so he he asked me to to from on his behalf uh, to just say a very few words on the ISM program, on the VRF ISM program. It has a thematic direction uh, in, under three headings, impact, governance, and integration. So impacts uh, means both environmental, social, economic um, uh, impacts. Governance, including planning, financing, institutional aspects, and so on, and integration. So it's the interaction and integration between informal and perhaps we call it formal then or scheduled uh, transit systems and, and urban uh, transportation in general. 
Uh, the program is structured around three pillars of action. So it's about the first pillar is knowledge building. Um, the, the second pillar is communities of learning, meaning both uh, sharing information, sharing results, but also building a sort of community around the program. Uh, and, and the third pillar is supporting next generation scholars. Uh, some characteristics of the ISM program, it's, it has a geographical focus on low and middle income countries. Uh, it's about comparative studies. <clears throat> it, but e even if the focus is, uh, the geographical focus is, is on low and middle income countries, uh, the program is about collaboration and exchange between researchers and others globally. So both high income countries and low and middle income countries. So that's also uh, important. And we see uh, this uh, global uh, <clears throat> distribution of participants today here, which is nice to see. Uh, finally, uh, the methodological approach is to be interdisciplinary and perhaps also to some extent transdisciplinary. We will hear more about the living labs, which to me, it represents uh, a, a transdisciplinary uh, methodology for knowledge building. And with that uh, said and done uh, from my side, I just want to thank all of you who have joined this event, and in particular, all the people joining uh, the research and educational side consortia. I just also want to thank uh, my colleagues at BREF for here. I, I, present Jane Summerton, scientific advisor to VRF. Many of you know Jane from other events and, uh, and, and research. We also have Karen Henriksson, who is hosting this event, uh, communications officer at VRF. Um, and I don't see if there's anybody else from VRF joining. Please uh, write in the chat if so. But Holger is an important person, as we said. Holger Dalkman, he's coordinating this program. And many of you have come across Holger in the activities. So with that, thank you and good luck. Uh, you will need some good luck, right? <laughs> and uh, good luck for today and, and for the remaining time uh, of, of the activity. So with that, I think it's over to you, Jackie. Great. Well, thank you, Henrik and, and all of BREF for making this whole moment possible and all the work that we're going to do together possible. So I'm Jackie Klopp, and I'm at the Center for Sustainable Urban Development at Columbia University at our climate school here in New York City. And I'm really honored to launch this new international research program with you. And the idea is to launch very early so all of you can see who's involved, what we're up to, and find connection points, because our vision is that this is very much an inclusive process moving forward and that we'll talk a little bit more about how all of you can get involved. So uh, yeah, so Karen, can maybe we start with the slides? Yes. Wonderful. So um, the theme or motto of our work was really equity ecosystems and engagement really for transformation. Uh, next slide. And let me tell you a little bit about that. So we're coming out of a, a rather sobering COP process <laughs> where we know we have very serious climate crisis issues and we must address them. We're at a moment of profound inequality uh, in, across the globe, coming also out of a pandemic. We're in a moment of massive uh, technological transformation. But one thing we know when we come to our cities is that to address many of these problems together, we need to build really, really high quality, multimodal public transport systems and access for everyone. And right now across our globe, but particularly in places, uh, cities in Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East and so forth, in the global South, a great deal of the service um, in terms of transport and access 
is provided by informal and shared mobility modes that have been systematically marginalized, not invested in and not understood. So this is a moment really where we need to move towards evidence-based transformation. And the three major principles behind our work are really equity. We have a focus on lower income, underserviced communities and vulnerable populations with it really thinking about equality of access, high quality service and opportunity, and thinking about climate, environmental and social ju justice, um, especially as more money comes into addressing emissions reductions, we need to make sure that we get the benefits, the technology, and it really engage with the informal and shared mobility sector. We also had this idea of ecosystems, um, not thinking necessarily ecological ecosystems, although we care about those a lot too, but really focusing on informal and shared transport as not just a way to get from A to B and create access, but really about livelihoods, labor, businesses, uh, community and economies. So making sure that when we look at these different modes and systems that we're really taking a whole of society approach and thinking about broader implications. And finally, we care a great deal about engagement. At engagement at multiple scales that needs to happen for transformation. And we have with us the World Resource Institute, the Global Network for Popular Transportation, Transport, sorry. And um, you know, they're working at a very high kind of global level to make transformation in decision-making, investment, and policy. And then we're going deep, deep down into our respective locations and places for the taking a very sort of living lab approach where we're deeply engaged in these places and the ecosystems and thinking about what kinds of interventions and transformations need to happen. And we do that in a highly democratic and um, uh, mode of sort of co-production. So then going from the living labs that you're gonna hear about in a second to really building up the evidence and the understanding and also the comparisons of what is sort of more generic as problems and what are very specific approaches that need to be tailored to a particular place, we, we are hoping to aggregate and take this knowledge and push it up to the to the multiple sort of national and global levels for change. So hence evidence-based transformation is one of our catchwords. So with that introduction, <laughs> I'm going to have us jump right into these very exciting um, living lab teams and let them explain um, their own uh, ideas and approaches. So we will start by alphabetical order with Accra and Kumasi. So Ransford, it's over to you. And by the way, people should feel free to just put any kinds of questions or comments in the chat. Uh, thanks very much, uh, uh, Jackie. So uh, quickly introducing myself, I'm uh, Ransford Echampo and I'm senior lecturer in transport and urban futures uh, based at the University of Manchester. Uh, in the UK. Uh, could you go to the next slide, please? Um, and then the next slide. Thank you. So for um, our uh, research uh, as part of this uh, you know, program, uh, we're basically focusing on Accra and, and Kumasi. So you are looking at these cities and their uh, surrounding areas. So just for you know, your information, Accra is the capital of Ghana and then Kumasi is the second largest uh, city. Um, you can't forget about the long title that we have here, but essentially what we are trying to do is the question we are trying to ask ourselves is how can we make the most of existing modes of transport and services to improve accessibility, to address uh, challenges of uh, associated with inequalities uh, of access. And we are doing this recognizing that well, there is an established uh, kind of um, ecosystem where we have had these conventional uh, popular or public transport services. And then there is uh, the emergence of new app-based ICT-mediated uh, mobility services. So how do we you know, join up 
and take advantage of these uh, modes and, and services to improve accessibility and, 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 and in, in an equitable way. Uh, so for uh, our research, core research uh, team, uh, in addition to uh, myself, uh, we have here my colleague, uh, Ernest Ajeman, uh, who is also a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana. And then another colleague, uh, Festival uh, Godwin, who is a senior research uh, associate at the University of uh, Oxford. So in addition to uh, this uh, core group, we have you know, a wide network of uh, you know, researchers and also uh, public sector actors and other uh, stakeholders uh, in these uh, two cities that we will be uh, working. Uh, next slide, please. So just to give a, a bit of context of you know, why uh, we are talking about this and also, I guess, tying into our ecosystem approach. So I think quickly what I would like to say here you know, is that the ecosystem of transport and mobility in these in Ghana and 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 elsewhere, you know, is, is essentially evolving. So as I've already uh, indicated, uh, for a very long time we've had these informal, you know, uh, public transport uh, services systems, you know, the trotro, the taxis, actually, uh, you know, uh, uh, moving people from one point to uh, another, uh, in the absence of any sort of uh, sustained public sector intervention. Uh, in, in, in the last, you know, a couple of decades, I should say, uh, we've had a number of public sector interventions aimed at reforming, uh, you know, the, the transport uh, sector, but most of them have essentially failed. So uh, for those of you familiar with the situation in Ghana, then you would have interventions around the metro mass transit, trying to bring about, you know, uh, a mass transit, inter and intra urban mass transit. Uh, we have experimented with Bus rapid transit, and uh, that has essentially failed. Although I should, you know, uh, acknowledge that there is like one line of BRT, you know, still running but not uh, doing so efficiently uh, in Accra as we speak. Um, in in addition to this, in again in recent years, we've had this growing presence of other forms of micro transit. So I'm talking about uh, uh, these, uh, you know, in in our context, what we call Pragya and Abu Boya. So for, again, those who are familiar with Ghana, but these are two Villa, three Villa uh, micro uh, transits also coming in. And then uh, again, in the last you know five years or so, we've had the uh, presence of app-based ICT uh, mediated uh, services. So I'm talking about Uber and Bolt and all the other um, ICT mediated services. So this from the point of view of the modes, this is how the ecosystem looks like. But I think you know the fact that we talk about ecosystem doesn't mean that they are kind of mutually beneficial, you know, and supportive kind of links and relationships. There are also adversarial relationships. So this, this we have this complex, really complex, highly contested and political ecosystem, uh, comprising of the modes that I'm talking about, the services that they offer, and also the actors involved, so operators, incumbent and new. Uh, the livelihoods and, and the workers involved, the public sector institutions, passengers, those who use uh, these uh, uh, services and modes to meet their everyday mobility needs. So we really want to understand uh, this ecosystem and then see how best uh, we can uh, start, you know, as a starting point to thinking about how do we uh, transform, bring about transformative action uh, in this uh, area. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, in terms of what uh, we are trying to uh, achieve, I think, again, uh, you know, uh, highlighting and reinforcing some of, of the things that Jackie has already you know, uh, mentioned, I think we are very much interested in working with our stakeholders. So it's not just about the core team here, but it's actually learning from what is happening on the ground, trying to understand what the challenges are, and not just about challenges. I think uh, it's time that we move to looking at pathways, strategies, and solutions to bringing about this and it's all within this framework of social justice and how do we improve accessibility and mobility now i think for any and you would agree with me that for any uh, sort of transformative action uh, you need a coalition of you know actors so i'm talking about stakeholders uh, with a common mission values you know shared kind of vision to bring about this uh, transformation now, um, in, 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 in my own work and in also some of the work that we've been doing in Ghana, the, the transport and mobility domain is one area where such a, a, you know, collision of actors is completely missing. I mean, you have you know, fragmented actors here and there you know, doing their own thing. 
So, for example, a typical example of the collision of actors, for example, that I'm, I, I can think about is the, uh, the Federation of Slum Dwellers, right? So this is a really powerful movement, you know, uh, but we don't have something similar to this uh, in, 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 in the Ghanaian uh, context. So how can we begin to think about mobilizing all the resources that people, the stakeholders, uh, in this context to start to think about, uh, you know, uh, reforming and bringing about transformation in this sector? Uh, in terms of what we are going to do and how we are translating these two uh, goals, I think it's about first and foremost creating, you know, knowledge, and it's not just creating academic knowledge and publishing, you know, in our fancy academic articles, but uh, general. Sorry, it's about policy relevant uh, insights, and what we've sought to do is to tackle this in three key uh, areas. So the first um, area is basically to try and understand the landscape. You know, I've given you a sketch of what the landscape looks like, but it looks more complex uh, than what I have, I have said so far. So how do we understand this landscape? And most importantly, what are the policy and governance issues? Because that is where we can start uh, to think about the way uh, forward. And we are doing this again in the face of pervasive digital technologies and also the conventional you know, uh, popular transport that uh, we all know. Um, we also want to understand how these uh, modes and services are interacting. So that's, uh, again, a useful uh, starting point. Uh, if you go to Ghana right now, then um, organically, there is some form of uh, interaction happening, uh, you know, across and, and among these modes. But we, we want to dig deeper into that. And also from the point of view of mobility and accessibility, how do they combine? How do they interact? Uh, uh, to to address and to what extent are they actually uh, meeting the accessibility and needs uh, you know of of um, the poor urban poor low income households and I guess anyone uh, who uh, relies on uh, these uh, modes of uh, transport. Um, by now, I think you would uh, recognize that most of what we're talking about is around integration, right, and harnessing. Uh, the complementarities between or among uh, these, uh, you know, uh, modes. So uh, we recognize that there is a political dimension. Policy issues are really critical. Institutional and you know technical conditions are all uh, necessary. So we are trying to understand, you know, all these different, uh, you know, aspects and ultimately to help us uh, bring about the needed uh, uh, transformation, which is. How do we make use of, you know, uh, these uh, resources and and, and assets and uh, the complex network network of actors uh, to actually uh, bring about uh, equitable uh, mobility and accessibility in this context. So uh, I hope uh, this gives you kind of a taste of what we are trying to do. And I would be happy to take any comments and suggestions uh, uh, in, in, in the chat. And then at some point when we have the opportunity to uh, have a discussion, I would also welcome your feedback and any suggestions. Thank you. Thanks, Ransford. That was really fantastic. Um, I think just uh, for purposes of time, and I think you gave people a lot to think about, we'll move on to Bangkok and then we'll circle back at the end. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, um, can you hear me? Yes. I can. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Saksi Chalampong. I uh, represent Bangkok Living Lab. Uh, I am with uh, from Chulalongkorn University Transportation Institute in Bangkok, Thailand. Um, next slide, please. Uh, let me first introduce briefly my my uh, Bangkok Living Lab team. Uh, we have uh, three other. Uh, key people. Uh, the first is uh, Lisa Kenny and uh, Onicha and Chan Chai. Both of them are researchers at the Transportation Institute uh, at the university. And uh, the fourth person is Apiwat Ratanawaraha from Urban Regional Planning Department and the Center for Science, Technology and Society at uh, Jalalongkorn University as well. Uh, we have worked uh, together on uh, the topic of this uh, um, living lab, uh, and that is uh, electrification of motorcycles, motorcycle taxis in particular. And we have engaged uh, previously with other stakeholders uh, that include um, uh, government agencies, the regulators, 
uh, the uh, private sector's um, manufacture of um, uh, electric motorbikes, um, uh, uh, electricity generating authority of Thailand, as well as, as the operators of the uh, informal transport uh, modes of interest here, which is motorcycle taxis. Uh, next slide, please. So that uh, we we in in our living lab we will focus on the electrification of motorbike taxis as part of uh, low carbon popular transport. Why this is important? Uh, in Bangkok, we have uh, nearly ninety thousand motorbike taxi um, operating every day, and um, we estimate roughly half a million to a million trips per day uh, carried by uh, motorbike uh, taxis. And that's a whole lot of carbon emission. And uh, uh, to electrify uh, these vehicles would contribute a lot to uh, bringing down carbon, carbon emission in Bangkok. Uh, however, these uh, motorbike uh, taxis, admittedly, they're not really, not 100% informal. They are more of a semi-formal transport. They are regulated uh, uh, in many, many aspects. Uh, and those, uh, while can solve the problem uh, that led to the regulation at the first place, like safety, security, um, like fighting between operators, uh, they at the same time, they uh, uh, present obstacles to uh, electrification or some other new uh, technologies that uh, 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 just arrived, uh, like uh, electric uh, vehicles. Uh, in this case, for motorcycle taxis, the current leg regulation uh, uh, prevent um, uh, present some obstacles to the uh, the conversion. For example, um, the registration of the uh, vehicles currently uh, make it difficult uh, for uh, uh, the shared shared battery uh, business model. Um, so that makes it. Um, the cost for owning the electric motorcycle taxi is very high, and so that uh, discouraged uh, drivers to convert. At the same time, we also have some redundancy in tax surcharges uh, in on imported batteries. Uh, there's also insufficient battery swapping and charging stations. All these uh, make costs of ownership high and discourage ownership. Um, drivers lack of knowledge about uh, electric motorbike, uh, especially on maintenance, uh, as well as the financing, the lack of financing and in insurance in place uh, make it um, difficult for owners to, uh, for, for drivers to, uh, to purchase and to uh, uh, own um, electric motorbike and use them for taxi service. So this is kind of our problem. We have like the uh, regulations in place, but at, at the same time, these regulations uh, becomes the burden or the obstacle for conversion to uh, electric motorbike taxis in Bangkok. Next slide, please. So our approach here, since we recognize that uh, the problem here is also governance, is it's not only about uh, uh, encouraging people to convert, but it also the, the governance, the current forms of governance, not conducive to the uh, adoption of electric uh, vehicles. In this case, electric motorbike. So we we aim to uh, take governance as an endogenous factor in our living lab, and uh, uh, we recognize that right now. We are not the only uh, people who work on uh, um, trying to encourage the conversion of uh, electric motor uh, to electric motorbikes. There are several other teams that are working independently to uh, to promote this uh, electrification of uh, uh, informal uh, mode of transportation. Uh, but they tend to uh, uh, operate independently and uh, there is no space that uh, would uh, uh, engage them and coordinate them. So we aim to provide this space uh, to help uh, coordinate the stakeholders, uh, including the uh, government stakeholders, uh, 
to help to inform the governance and institutional frameworks for the successful transition to a sustainable low carbon electrified motorbike uh, taxi system. And uh, at the same time, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to come up with this uh, good uh, governance, uh, we would also take into account uh, social implications uh, of the electrification of the motorbike taxis, uh, equity issues, um, uh, how that uh, uh, this uh, uh, governance would affect uh, different uh, groups of drivers or passengers um, uh, uh, this, uh, differently, and also the environmental environmental implications of the uh, uh, governance of the uh, electrification of motorbike taxis. And uh, to do this, uh, to take governance as an endogenous factor in our living lab, we would take this three steps uh, uh, method uh, to, to do so. First is we would assess the current governance system, governance ecosystem uh, framework for the electric motorbikes. We would then bring together the stakeholders uh, in the focus uh, uh, to focus groups and workshops to discuss uh, and to map ongoing uh, EM initiatives uh, that I mentioned that there are several uh, teams uh, that are working independently. We we're going to try to map them and we're going to try to use the participatory research and design um, to identify governance needs according to this map uh, and to create uh, uh, new institutional frameworks that would effectively promote uh, electrification of motorbike taxi and their conversion. Next slide, please. Uh, why is this important? Um, in many developing countries, uh, there is uh, no uh, governance uh, of uh, informal tra transport at all. Uh, and but in the case of Thailand, um, it's a living proof that in Bangkok uh, we have governance, but the governance can um, uh, become like an obstacle to this uh, uh, sustainable transition. Uh, so uh, we we re we recognize that uh, a good uh, adequate governance uh, needs to be in place to promote the low carbon transition, and uh, this is not going to be uh, not going, going to apply to only motorbike taxis, but also other modes of uh, informal transport as well, um, including tuk-tuks, three-wheelers, uh, minivans, taxis, or even the delivery motorbikes. So uh, we uh, think that this is an important lesson that can be learned uh, from Bangkok Living Lab, and this can be applied to uh, other modes of transport not only in Bangkok, but also in other Southeast Asian countries uh, and uh, other parts of the global South uh, with similar uh, informal transport system. And uh, with that, I, I conclude my presentation of Bangkok Living. Thank you, Saxith. Uh, I think people are already starting starting to see a bit of a, you know, the theme, the theme and the approach um, that we're taking across these different cities. And it'll be extremely exciting to start, you know, having these conversations across the living labs. And I can see Sheila in the chat has already started to make connections from India to Accra. And, and this is sort of the idea of this, this uh, network. So um, thank you, thank you so much. We're gonna move on to Beijing. Sue. Thank you, thank you, Jackie. And uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so first, uh, my name is Su Song from World Resources Institute uh, Sustainable Cities Program in China, Beijing office. So uh, I'm, uh, so now uh, regarding to the living lab for Beijing, uh, uh, you know, we have uh, actually for most Chinese cities, uh, we have very difficult uh, definition of what is the informal. Uh, it is hard to define what uh, what uh, modes are informal, what modes are formal. But uh, we do have uh, several kinds of uh, shared, uh, several different modes of uh, share, shared mobili mobility modes. 
in Chinese cities. So you can see in the in the slide here, we have typically the sh uh, shared bike, a shared e-bike, ride sharing, ride hailing, and on-demand van, on-demand bus, uh, as well as the um, uh, two, three wheelers for uh, a last mile urban delivery. So uh, for our living lab in Beijing, we are trying to kind of uh, connect, integrate uh, each kind of these different kinds of shared mobilities within the one platform we call mobilities as a service platform, try to uh, link all these uh, kinds of shared mobilities, um, specifically the green uh, kinds of shared mobilities, for example, uh, bike sharing, bike e-sharing within the uh, platform and connect with the public transport, for example, the bus systems and also metro systems. So for the Living Lab for Beijing, we are more focusing on the green and equal mobility as a service systems that is linked share mobilities in Chinese cities. Next slide, please. So for the Living Lab in Beijing, we have uh, five key members, uh, including myself from WI China office, and also Professor Xu Hongji from North China uh, University of Technology, which uh, already have existing strong platform to integrate, uh, to have the stakeholder dialogue with different uh, stakeholders uh, from the shared mobility industries and government. And also Professor Yi Lin Ma from Beijing Transport Institute, which is under the Beijing Transport Authorities, uh, which is leading the planning and uh, um, also design the platform of Beijing Green Mobility as a Service uh, System. And of course, my two colleagues, uh, Benjamin Valley and Han from uh, WI Global Office from DC. And also in terms of uh, next generation scholars, we are now currently recruiting PhD and master candidates from uh, universities and other potential research institutes in Chinese cities. And also we have also uh, engaging uh, other stakeholders and partners from the industries, including the mobility as a service operators, for example, Gaudi Map as well as uh, some other uh, share mobility providers. For example, the share bike uh, companies, Hello Bike and DD Chuxing and Meituan. And also we are uh, trying, because we are also trying to uh, scale the green mobility as a service concept uh, across the Chinese cities. So we have also engaged national level research institute, including the China Academy of Transportation Science, and also Research Institute of Highway under the Ministry of Transport in China. Next slide, please. So uh, um, during the previous studies, we have already identified some gaps and also some potentials in China's shared mobility services. We can see from the chart here um, that uh, we have conducted several surveys last year uh, uh, asking the uh, people from 12 Chinese cities, the uh, users of existing shared mobility services that uh, we can see that most of the, the users think that uh, by using the potential uh, mobility as a service system, it can help them to reduce CO2 reductions and also to uh, help them change behavior to, to uh, not buy a new car, after they're uh, using the shared mobility systems. But of course, uh, we have some gaps to be filled. Uh, we can see uh, from the bullet points here that uh, uh, honestly, there's still lack of uh, a specific service from the uh, shared mobility system that provides service to the, to the vulnerable group, including the disabled, and also especially the elderly and lower income peoples. And also uh, most share mobility systems in Beijing lack of uh, climate resilient. And also uh, we found from our last study that there's a lack of, extremely lack of studies of the impact assessment studies uh, from the share mobility systems in terms of health impact assessment and also the life cycle environmental uh, assessment and also the health uh, uh, road safety issues. 
and uh, of course for for some chinese cities and also even in beijing there's still lack of uh, some certain legislations and uh, governance um, for the existing share mobilities and mobility as a service system next slide please so uh, based on the existing gaps and uh, we have designed the uh, six six components uh, around the living lab of, uh, in Beijing. Uh, the first one is that uh, we are trying to conduct the impact assessment research um, uh, in uh, in Beijing that uh, we have uh, uh, studied the indicators uh, against the three um, components. The first is uh, social impact, including the equity issue, the safety issue, uh, and also other social economic issues. And the third uh, component is uh, study the environmental impact of the system, environmental and healthy impact of systems, including the carbon reduction potentials and other air pollutants potentials benefits from the shared mobility systems, and also the health um, uh, health benefits by using the share specifically for the share bike systems in 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 China uh, and uh, specifically in Beijing. And also uh, uh, during this study, we have also uh, designed Excel-based or web-based uh, policy database and using the database to do the comparative studies across different Chinese cities in China and uh, hopefully uh, across the different uh, cities in the world in the future. And also we have uh, designed a by biennial China Share Mobility Review report um, every two years and uh, to um, review the current status and challenges and development of current uh, green, green mobility as a service and, as well as the shared mobility integrated in the systems. And uh, next one is the green mass practices in Beijing and other cities. Because Beijing's green mass is very special in the world, it is the first one to connect it, uh, uh, people be green behavior change by using the shareable mobility in the mass systems and link this with local carbon market. So we are going to uh, study the benefits from these uh, systems and of, of, of course, uh, and the cost uh, from these systems and try to learn the detailed mechanisms, cost benefit of the system and try to scale up to other cities. And of course, we have we will con uh, conduct the green mass seminar uh, every year and um, recruit the next generation young scholars to join our, uh, our uh, program. Next slide, please. And for the very next step, we are going to um, having the 20 Chinese cities survey next year, which is 2024. We have already conducted the survey for uh, uh, two times, twice for the 2022 and also the 2016, uh, 18. So uh, for the next year, we are going to connect other, the third round of user experience service. Uh, regarding the uh, the people's experience of the existing shared mobility systems and the green mass systems uh, around uh, twenty Chinese cities and try to compare compare them in terms of different uh, uh, various aspects, including the social aspect and also uh, equity, safety, environmental potential, equity, and health benefits and we are also going to quantify the results from, from the survey for the next year. So I think that's it. This That is uh, leaving that for Beijing. Thank you so much, Sue. Again, there was a lot there. Um, I think we do have to pick up the pace a little bit um, because everyone's so excited about their work. We're going a little bit over time. So, and we'd like to have a little bit of conversation at the end, but th thanks so much. That was amazing. So much great work there. All right, Bogota. Thank you, Jackie. Um, hello everyone. Hola para Latinoamerica. Uh, my name is Luis Guzman. I'm the leader in our future living lab here in Bogota. And I'm very thrilled to introduce our future work about this. And Jackie, I'm going to be brief because the the time I know. Uh, next, please. 
Uh, here first, I want to introduce uh, the main team. My name is Luis Angel Guzman. Uh, we also have uh, copy eyes like Daniel Oviedo in UCL and Olga Lucia Sarmiento, who is a epidemiologist and expert in, 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 in all, all these issues. And we also have a very uh, nice and, and, and novelty partner that is called the Wawa. It's a shared uh, mobility as a service company. And we all together, we are trying to, 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 to work with, with, uh, within our living lab to trying to integrate technology and uh, for getting mobility in the in the in the very uh, up, um, unaccessibility places in the city. As you know, uh, next please. As you know, Bogota, uh, the scale of Bogota is huge. Uh, just for for instance, our public transport system, which which is based only on buses, BRT and regular buses, moves around 4 million people every day. Or uh, in, in that sense, our, our supply of public transport services are, are, are covers most of the city, but still with that level of service, we have a uh, very spots around, uh, especially in poor neighborhoods, which uh, uh, the informal transport is is rising is rising and we even we we probably it identify a uh, two main problems the local trips the intra neighbor uh, trips and the price so the key problems that we uh, as i say probably identify uh, identify was the, uh, the 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 regular public transport system uh, it's not satisfying some specific demands, especially uh, uh, in some places for the woman, for the mobility of curves, for instance. And other issue are the travel uses and preference because, because for most of the Bogotas, Bogotanos, for most of the population, the travel uses, uh, the travel patterns are not uh, completely satisfied for, for the system. Another issue is the schedules and routes. Uh, the travel times in Bogota are very high for most of the people. And sometimes the, sh the schedules and routes are not useful for, for those kind of people. And I, I, I remember here, I, I, I mentioned it again here, a woman who uh, needs to get uh, several uh, care uh, mobility. And finally, uh, Bogota is huge. We got uh, several uh, security issues and another uh, reasons uh, for 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 the rising of the informal system in some places is the is the harassment for the women in the public transport system and we also identific, identify uh, several gender gaps but not all the informal transport departments in the city is the same in the, especially for this reason we identify or we want to study two mainly a uh, uh, phenomena in the city. The one, the first one, next please. The 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 uh, the first one is the uh, informal transport, as as we see in the in the previous pictures, all SUVs, and this kind of transport uh, work together, were uh, parallel with the with the regular public transport system. And it's basically located in poor and peripheral uh, neighborhoods in the city. And that kind of transport is used uh, mainly for local trips, for intra neighborhood trips. And why? Because it's cheaper than the formal transport. It's cheaper and they have more uh, better frequencies and better routes. The second point is, uh, as we say in previous presentations, Informal transport based in pedicabs, in busy taxis, and uh, how is how uh, we say in Spanish, which is used mainly as a feeder uh, mode to the to connect or mass public transport setting or BRT with uh, the with the with the neighborhoods. Why uh, and this and this kind of transport is growing a lot. Uh, 
basically uh, because because the, the the feeder system is quite slow and the frequency is not very nice and we have a lot of trips in uh, last mile trips in that kind of um, of, of um, system and what I want to know what, what I want to do in our living labs we have well several several ideas I know we have a very uh, a definite uh, time but we we want to know the travel demand needs why do people use that why why the people use the informal transport and what kind what is the main user women young women or women without or with children uh, what is the origin what is the main destinations uh, if uh, as as we know uh, we have to make several trip chains in in day so I need to leave my kids in the school. Then I go to the market. Then I have to I have to go to visit my mom or my friends or something something that. And one and with with that knowledge, we want to uh, working with the Wawa with our partner using different tech channels like SMS messages or WhatsApp. That uh, one advantage that we have here in Colombia is is for free and we want to use that technology and working with the community using mixed methods to try to find out how can we solute a, a, that kind of problems that we identify we identify in previous consultation in 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 in, in our living lab and finally next this is quite important. This is quite important because our ultimate goal is using technology. We we want to figure out how can of it is possible to integrate using tech systems, that informal systems, with the formal public transport system. To, 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 why? Because we, we we are convinced that that kind of ideas could be very could be better for everyone and for the city. And for, but, but for do that, it's quite important to understand why the informal transport is still attractive for the people. And how this work? What issues or, or what, what we, uh, the new policies that the city the, 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 or public transport system should do to try to adapt uh, the services of uh, for this people. And another important issue is that the supply, supply demand feedback, uh, uh, feedback is dynamic. It's uh, the day of the, the order of the day, the origin of the trip, the destination of the trip, of the trip change constantly around the day, around the weeks, around the months. So we want to try to understand that in our living life uh, to, to, to improve, basically to improve the quality of life or of the citizens. And thank you. Thanks so much, Luis. Very exciting, very, very exciting work. And I can see a lot of excitement in the chat also about learning about the process um, and sharing. Uh, and some people's eyes are open because they often think of Bogota as having a really, really good public transport system. I saw Chatty mentioned that <laughs> and not seeing this whole other side. So fantastic. Um, Thank you. Let's move on to Cape Town. Thank you, Jackie. Um, I'll try to be lightning quick if we can move to the next slide. Thank you. Just to introduce my members, the academics in our team are myself, Roger Behrens, uh, Obi Nene and Mark Zaitkis, colleagues in the Center for Transport Studies in the Department of Civil Engineering at uh, UCT. And in our group, we're going to be fusing the idea of living labs with the idea of embedded PhD researchers, which is a model of PhD research that we've had around for, for quite a while. Um, and in this model, uh, the PhD candidate spends part of their time at the university with their supervisors and part of their time with a host organization working on a project that's re relevant to their research. And so we're going to be focusing our resources on two such um, uh, PhD researchers. The first is uh, Hanifa Gabe, who's on the call today, I'm pleased to see, who will be um, working with a 
a tech startup in Cape Town um, called Loop, emerging out of the Mannenberg Taxi Association. And the photograph on the previous slide uh, shows you what Mannenberg looks like. Um, and the second um, uh, PhD embedded scholar will be uh, working with the uh, part of the city of Cape Town transport directorate that deals with um, uh, transition and liaison with the minibus taxi industry. We call our, our unscheduled minibus taxi service, uh, mini, minibus services, minibus taxis in Cape Town. Um, next slide. Um, be before describing the, the work of those two uh, embedded PhDs, uh, just something about the, the context that prevails in Cape Town that we'll be researching in. The first is that we have uh, fragmented um, uh, public transport governance at different tiers of, of government responsible for different public transport modes. Inevitably, this leads to a fragmented public transport service network with duplicative routes and um, inefficient operations and uh, poor quality of services for passengers, particularly in relation to our minibus taxi services, we have uh, a predominant target system, um, a business model where um, drivers give uh, owners of the vehicle a set amount each day and keep the the whatever's left over as income, uh, which leads to problems around aggressive driving and 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 behaviors like fill and go from ranks. Um, there have been various initiatives to try and improve quality of services that have either stalled or abandoned. The transport operating uh, company model uh, trialed in Mitchell's Plain and the Blue Dot scheme incentive scheme, uh, both while somewhat successful in various ways. Um, have are, are no longer in operation now. And then finally, uh, we have a, a, a quantity licensing regime for our minibus uh, taxis, which is almost a, a, it has its origins almost 100 years ago, which has really been unable to manage market entry or rationalize fleets and, and, and route networks. There's lots of overlap. The, there's a mismatch very often between uh, supply and demand. And the legislation that empowers our uh, regulatory system actually prevents uh, uh, minibus taxi operators from moving to to larger buses, and so we um, desperately need to to think more innovatively about regulation in this space. Next slide, please. So the two <clears throat> projects, um, uh, Hanifa's project um, um, in, embedded in 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 the Loop app. So Loop, as I said. Uh, uh, a tech startup emerging out of the Mannenberg Taxi Association, um, partnering with some young, uh, bright uh, computer science types, uh, have produced an app um, uh, that deals with cashless fare collection and, and uh, chartered ride sourcing. Um, and so the basic idea that Hanifa has is to explore industry reform from the perspective of kind of, you know, industry-led economic development rather than purely sort of punitive regulatory interventions. And the method is going to be a, a, a living lab in, 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 I think, in the true sense, uh, sort of a ground floor monitoring of uh, the cashless fare collection and rice sourcing uh, uh, technology disruptions across a number of, of stakeholders, from association leaders to owners to drivers to conductors to passengers. And then the second uh, embedded scholar will, will essentially look at plans that the, uh, the city council uh, has um, to adopt a more proactive operating licensing regime uh, uh, if and when it receives devolved operating licensing functions from the uh, provincial government and utilize the, the seven year time frame for operating licenses to uh, perhaps be better match supply and demand and create a, a, a more balanced uh, public transport network. And uh, the method here will be building on the, 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 the work of, of my colleague, Obi Nene, looking at operator and passenger cost uh, route and vehicle size optimization. Um, and uh, hopefully use this as an informant to this uh, proactive licensing regime that the municipality wishes to introduce. Next slide, please. Um, uh, uh, just a couple of comments then about uh, 
the broader importance of these projects. Well, scalable uh, interventions aimed at quality um, improvement in, in uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa has, has proved fairly elusive. And uh, perhaps there's lessons uh, from industry-led <clears throat> technology disruptions at business development as <clears throat> a way of pursuing that objective. Um, in multi-stakeholder contexts, finding mutually accessible cashless fare collection and right sourcing technologies that um, can endure has also been somewhat elusive in, in Sub-Saharan Africa as uh, another one of our embedded PhD scholars, Tinka Aruho, has found. And a technology that doesn't force an immediate disruption of this target system that I mentioned and doesn't expose necessarily the owners to um, a greater income tax might uh, have better prospects of, of surviving. And then finally, um, as I said, our, our existing regulatory uh, framework and legislation contributes to operating inefficiencies. And there might well be out of that optimization research uh, uh, potential for rationalizing uh, the service and informing such a, a proactive uh, licensing regime. Thank you. Let me hand over to the next speaker. Thanks, Roger. And uh, I think everyone can take a big breath because this, this is so much, right? In, in such a short time, all of these projects represent so much. Um, so I just want everyone to refocus for our last two uh, living labs. And someone was asking why only these cities? Well, you can already see there's a lot here um, to work with, but we are thinking about how we'll bring in other cities through what we'll talk about at the end. Um, Fabulous, and I love the embedded scholar idea. That goes so well with the uh, with the living lab approach, and it'll be interesting to see that across the different projects. Now, after a big breath, we're going to fully concentrate and get to our la to our last two living labs, um, Mumbai. Okay, uh, good evening from Mumbai, and uh, well, uh, like I'll just explain you the context of our living lab. Uh, so it's located in the periphery of so Mumbai. It's in a a uh, suburban location called uh, Nala Sopara. This is, if you, if you know Mumbai, Mumbai is actually organized linearly along a suburban train lines. So this is one of the stations of the suburban train line. Though I personally don't like to use the word suburb for Nala Sopara, I would like rather refer to it as a periphery of the Mumbai metropolitan region. I'll come to it also why I don't like the word suburb, because suburb has a separate connotation in literature. Like it's a very active place. I consider it a very creative place also, and I'll tell you why also about that. So, uh, so Nala Sopara is a being a periphery. It's served by uh, the for the last mile connectivity through a system of auto rickshaws, and that's what we are actually uh, looking at and we are exploring. And uh, so, in the in the Nala Sopara in the in that neighborhood, there are actually areas which are middle class neighborhoods as well as there are industries and these industries have actually drawn a lot of migrants the migrants they work in industry as well as they obviously are also involved in driving these auto rickshaws so they actually are a part of this mobility system and as any informal mobility system would be they are also organized not organized by the government they are also organized around political unions they actually negotiate between who takes which routes. So the routes which are profitable are towards the middle class neighborhoods of the, of the suburb. And the routes which are actually uh, not well served are towards the industrial areas. And these industrial areas, as I have said, draw migrants, which brings in a lot of informality. In fact, this suburb has a larger informality than uh, Mumbai, what's known for Dharavi. So it has a larger informality than that. Okay, just to explain you our team, our team, like uh, obviously Spark, Sheila is there, I can see, Maria is there with us, and with us now is uh, Shitija as well as, uh, as, well as uh, Alex, and it's me, or Anirudh Paul, who is uh, like a technical advisor to Spark, as well as I'm a professor at the KRVIA. So KRVIA is our academic partner from where we do the knowledge dissemination, and as we have a very strong community partners who are already there working with us, the UI is a part of the of this uh, living lab. There are people 
who are helping us from migrant neighborhoods who are a part of this living lab and also certain unions of the auto unions who have joined us we form this living lab because we together frame what we require for this uh, for this neighborhood the next slide please okay uh, so for us uh, this living lab we look at it through the lens of livelihood and i'll explain you why we do that uh, one we look at the livelihood where mobility itself provides livelihood to many people there are many drivers operators who drive auto rickshaw here as well as in the city of mumbai they go to the city of mumbai though they are they don't drive their auto rickshaw here they go to the city of mumbai and park their auto rickshaws there okay and then they are providing the service so they are the providers then the other users okay there are many areas here which are very well served and there are many areas here in this suburb which are not well served in fact our initial study shows that as mobility reduces in these areas where there is no mobility it affects the livelihood of people so uh, to improve that i believe we take also a user perspective so it's livelihood from both the perspective from the perspective of the drivers as well as the users the next slide okay just to tell you what our living lab would be composed of so on the left side would be the action research area so that's the living lab which would be composed of uh, uh, people from spark from us our side there would be people from the neighborhoods who would be there who would be looking and negotiating with political organizations and urban local body so this would be this part of the living lab would clearly be about advocacy about activism the other part on the right side is the academic partner that's the krvia where there would be the understanding of disseminating the knowledge producing new knowledge from this lab disseminating to other partners so the whole academic dissemination would be done through the krvia in fact we will do it through some of their research program some of their postgraduate thesis program as well as they already have a center for resilience learn le learning and under that what we are going to do is we are going to actually uh, disseminate this knowledge to that that center for resilience learning is already a center which is supported with funds from the erasmus plus so we will plug in to that uh, center to disseminate the knowledge so that's uh, as far as our living lab is concerned the next slide this brings us to the last slide so this has been in consultation with the people of nala sopara the people through the through the unions through the uh, other ngos that have been working their demand is that this system should be recognized as a public transport system and what it does once they recognize it as a public transport system the government recognizes it as a public transport system it helps them to negotiate for better infrastructure like for them parking infrastructure is very important as i told you since there is no parking infrastructure lot of these auto drivers have to park their rickshaws in mumbai city where they have to come to mumbai city to conduct their livelihood so one of the one of the demands is better public infrastructure for them okay that will also improve community resilience because it brings in lot of possibilities of insurance benefits once you declare it as a public infrastructure education loan health benefits okay it also allows you route rationalization now as i have said the routes are organized by the political unions so there is no connectivity in many areas so but as i understand if you recognize it as a public transport there is a possibility that other areas can also be well served and as i have told you the idea of mobility and the idea of livelihood are connected as you increase mobility in a certain area the possibilities of livelihood increases and and there are other possibilities even of accessing easy loans of the government and encouraging green mobility so these are these are connected systems so these are possible when you declare it as a public transport system and also at the end it also helps lot of downstream industries to actually flourish so so that's the idea if we recognize it as a public and that's what the demand of these people have been to say that whether this could be recognized as a public infrastructure let me just end because i'll end this with um, understanding of this periphery 
and the fact that this periphery has a very extremely uh, like i would say creative culture in fact i'll just speak about the fact that this is a very strong music culture actually and uh, they are a like group which do the hip hop in 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 that area completely uh, like a, a learning from bollywood but the amazing thing is that these groups call themselves mumbai bombay local in, in with a l o k l not c a l bombay local which refers to the transport system of the city itself so mobility is a part of their uh, like daily lives because they are always negotiating mobility whether it be through the local trains or connecting to the last mile that is through the auto rickshaws so that is where i believe our project is so important and if we can bring changes here it would affect a lot of lives and bring livelihood in this neighborhood thank you thank you that was terrific and an excellent example of whole of society approach and really using livelihoods as an entry point to thinking about uh popular transport fantastic thank you um so much and last but not least we'll go to san jose costa rica and thank you jackie and thanks to everyone for the attention uh, as you can see well that picture is not necessarily the area that we will be analyzing but in the end we will be acting in the metropolitan area of san jose specifically in the district of pavas um i'm arturo stein for alvarez uh, i'm the coordinator for sustainable mobility at the centro para la sostenibilidad urbana one of the um, partners in this research and uh, next slide please next one um, we will be working as a group with part of my team and uh, next one please with different disciplines and sp especially a big core group uh, main uh, well comprised of women basically uh, in different areas architecture engineering environmental engineering and psychology and we are also uh, supported by the electrical um, engineering school from the University of Costa Rica and also in conversations with the civil engineering school uh, of the University of Costa Rica and also the Technological Institute of Costa Rica with their um, environmental engineering school so um, those would be our core partners and next generation scholars but also of course working alongside uh, different stakeholders such as uh, local government the national government which has the, um, the faculty of organizing everything related to uh, public transport, whether it's formal or informal, they'll, they will be the ones that have the, um, the power or the, the, the decision of how to include this um, type of transport in ne the next regulations that have to be improved and due to the information that will come out of this of this research. Next slide, please. Why is it important for us to start analyzing these things in in Costa Rica? We don't basically have any any base information on how popular transport services work or in show, uh, informal and shared mobility services work. So that leaves a gap for authorities to be able to understand them and see the potential around um, ISM, uh, informal and shared mobility. So that's one of the, um, of the main problems that we see here. We all know they exist, but there's no documentation associated to uh, how they work, who they employ, uh, where they go, etc. So uh, our research is important in generating all that baseline information, understanding why they exist, how many people they employ, why um, or how are they used, where do they go, are they um, using the same routes as popular, uh, of, as formal public transport. So all those questions um, we will be um, developing with this kind of research. And currently the operation of ISM or the informal services have no requirements. So that also puts people at risk, not only the people um, delivering those services, but the people utilizing those services too. So that's also important to understand how to improve those in order to improve the conditions for both the operators and the users. Um, next slide, please. What are we 
going to do? Well, first of all, test research, as in everything, we'll try to understand uh, if there's any information regarding this, um, the popular transport services from what we've seen, there's only one research and it wasn't necessarily done in the capital city and uh, in the more urban uh, areas, but mainly on the coastal um, touristic towns. So that's one of the things that we'll try to do. We'll try to learn from all the experiences that have been shared here to understand what could be done. Uh, we'll also see how it relates to the income of the people utilizing those services. If they are only uh, lower income communities, we will be working in an area that is relatively low income and um, a bit with different social um, situations that will make it uh, interesting to see how it works there. So that's something that we're looking forward to, but also with a certain caution of uh, protecting our our security and our uh, safety. Also, we'll try to understand the legal framework around these services. It might tend to be a bit ambiguous sometimes, and we'll, ha we'll have to see how they can either fit within the current one or which kind of um, of improvements need to be done at the frame, uh, legal framework level. We'll also understand how land use and public transport services are associated and also how accessible are these services, not only um, spatial wise, but also time wise. We know that uh, as Luis mentioned before, that there are services that don't mean that they are frequent and frequency is freedom as one of the most popular public transport um, consultants, Jared Walker says. Uh, so that's something that we will be trying to, under, uh, trying to understand why um, they are being used and how are we going to do this? We'll be able to start with the research questions in a more participatory way. We will be engaging in workshops with the authorities, with uh, local governments, operators, um, even public transport companies that even though they see it as a competition, sometimes it's better for them to be engaged from the start in order to see the how to complement uh, their networks and instead of see, seeing these kind of services as competition. Um, and also field research. Uh, you can't do anything in transport without going um, to the ground. And basically we will be talking to people, to operators, to um, the community as a whole in order to understand the usage and the routes, the demographics, et cetera. And also, interviewing different um, stakeholders around this topic. And I'm glad to see that there's a lot of people here uh, from the Costa Rican environment and looking forward to, to seeing you in the next few days. And I think that's my last slide. So I'll send it back to you, Jackie. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, wow, that was fantastic. Some of you are asking, how do I stay involved? I just wanna say uh, that we are going to have a presentation next that's going to give you some good ideas about that. But because of privacy protections in Europe, it's very important if you want to stay on our list that you direct message Karen with your email so that she can put you on the list and that serves as consent. So if you want to stay involved in this amazing conversation, um, please uh, please let Karen know what your email is. Yes, and, and thank I'll you so much to everyone who has already um, contributed with their email. So keep them coming. Um, we look forward to, to keep you connected to us. Great, thank you. Thank you. And now Andrea is gonna answer a lot of your questions about how we're gonna reach out to you. Andrea, please. Thank you, Jackie. So I was asked to do the tough job of trying to kind of wrap up all, all of the things we've we've spoken about today and, and talking a bit about networks in this transformation. So if we go to the next slide, I think one of the most common things that we found in the different living labs that presented today uh, and that we've seen in different countries around the world uh, where we see popular transportation is that even though it is actually a global phenomenon, it is in every country in the world, even in global north countries, uh, it's seen and treated as a local problem. We, we feel that it's something that affects our local communities or our cities, and we think we're the only ones that have this, but once we start talking to other 
countries or visiting other countries in the in the global south especially uh it's it's something that we all have in common and there it is it is kind of crossed by an idea that the perfect transportation system should look western european or north american that's kind of the the the, the imaginary uh, ideal of public transport systems that we have adopted however when we see these systems we realize that they are actually covering those uh demand gaps and those needs of mobilizing in in our cities but they are often considered inferior bad and that they should be substituted eradicated and substituted by the western models next slide please um so i think the question that we're all asking ourselves here is how much do we really understand about these systems and how can we really reimagine the way our public transport si transportation systems in the global south could be designed in a way that recognizes first the value of these existing systems right the contribution the importance and understanding them as assets not as problems if we problem uh, consider them as problems the approach is very different uh, than if we consider them as assets that are actually solving the problem that is lack of access to public transportation options and in a way that leaves no one behind so this is kind of the spirit of this consortium and trying to really understand how these systems work in different places and how they are uh, being governed, how they're being regulated, how they're transitioning towards decarbonization, how they're impacting social and economic dynamics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, please. Um, and why in this conversation and in this process of better understanding popular transport, do we need a network? And why is a network is important here? And it's basically to do that connection between the local and the global. If we learn about how this works at the local level in different places, it's much easier to exchange information between us, to, to disseminate information to other people that are outside of the consortium, to innovate, to learn from each other. So those learning curves are reduced. Um, also, we can connect with people that have different knowledge. Maybe someone who's specializing in electrification can learn from someone who's specializing in gender or in inclusion. And that way we close those knowledge gaps in a better way if we're all connected and learning from each other. And we'll also maximize resources. Instead of having to hire someone new here, I can ask someone else who had this experience in another country and we can share those knowledges and again accelerate the transition towards improving and strengthening the sector um, we will have an increased scope an increased impact a wider net of contacts and potential allies to after this work or beyond this work increase our action and collaborate with other people to mobilize more resources to continue to to improve uh, informal and shared mobility and finally by representing different contexts where this exists and where this resists as well, we will have a louder voice to advocate for change. Uh, there's power and strength in numbers, and we will also have the opportunity to amplify the voices from the people who are involved in each of these living labs to carry a message to global audiences of this is something that is an essential service in many cities in the world. And far from seeing it as a problem or seeing it as something that we need to eradicate, it, this is something that we need to look at, understand, and invest to improve and to dignify. Um, next slide, please. So what uh, is the Global Network for uh, Popular Transportation going to contribute to this consortium? Um, what we're going to do is do work from the inside of the consortium to the outside. So the first thing we're going to do is do so we're going to support uh, the university, Columbia University, in doing a little bit of sense making. So we're going to work with the different living labs um, so we can hear and catch what what trends, what learnings, what interesting things are coming up from the different living labs to develop a sense making board make sense of what we're learning document these learnings and share it to the outside world 
We have a monthly newsletter. Our newsletter, Pop Transport, go, comes out every month. So we're going to use that channel from the consortium to put out what are we learning, what events are going to happen in different places, where are we going to be speaking. So that's one of the channels that you can connect to, uh, our, our newsletter. Um, Benjamin de la Peña, men, uh, Benji uh, posted here the links, but I'll, I'll show you in a bit where you can find it. Uh, we're also going to do meet and greets, which is also something that our network does in general, but we're going to save space in the following years to have meet and greets specifically with the labs. So you can catch up and find out how the lab is doing, what the findings are, what methodologies are they using. So we're going to have this platform to be able to have a wider conversation with the public of what we're learning from this process. And finally, we're going to be hopefully in the most relevant global conferences on transport because this is a topic that is usually absent from local, uh, global conversations. And we want to be there constantly and we want to be part of the agenda uh, because it's the way most people around the world move. And we will be being present in these conversations to bring the learnings of the, of the living labs and of all the sense making we, we do in this process, in these conversations. So keep an eye out uh, for us in all of these events and also follow us in the newsletter. Um, we also have, a, next slide please, a LinkedIn group you will see. Uh, and here are the links as well. So follow Pop Transport and also join the LinkedIn group where we also post opportunities, events, reports, anything related to popular transportation and those are the best ways to to keep up up to date to everything with everything that's going to happen in the next couple of years. It will be exciting and very interesting. Thanks so much. That was amazing, Andrea. Amazing. Um, and people should join GNPT for sure. You have all our contacts, um, including the Andrea's and the Global Network on Popular Transport here, if you want. It's all on a QR code. And now I'll pass it over to Henrik for final comments and other ways you can connect with this work. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you, all presenters. Uh, this is almost overwhelming, such, such a richness. Uh, wow. Uh, so uh, I, I don't have very much to add now. I just wanted to point out that uh, within the VRF ISM program, uh, this is of course uh, the main activity, but we also, um, sometimes Jane is using the word a donut. It's, it's kind of the, the rest of the donut uh, where we try to do complementary stuff. Uh, so, so there are some smaller studies. We have already done a few of them as, as you can uh, see visiting our website and some some of you who have done the studies are here today so, uh, as authors we will continue doing uh, uh, additional studies picking up on on topics which might not be uh, the focus of any of the living labs or the IRP uh, we will also continue fostering uh, the network or the community of learning as as we say so so we are figuring out now between uh, the leadership of the IRP and uh, us as as VRF the, as pro program coordinator co coordinators for the ISM program, we're trying to figure out how to best uh, work together on that and what sits best in in the IRP and what sits best in under VRF. So this is a bit confusing. I admit that, but uh, we will we will find our way. I'm I'm pretty sure. Uh, so. Um, this is a bit of improvising, so I, I will ask Karin and Jane, my colleagues, if if there's anything important I have for, that I have forgotten to mention here today. We have upcoming. Not that I can uh, think about. Maybe maybe Jane has some something. No, I would just urge people if you have any ideas about further initiatives complementary to this program or as a greater part of our overall program, just feel free to be in contact with us. We're a small organization and we always wanna hear from researchers about good ideas. That's all I'd like to say. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. I think that's all for me.
Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure being here today and we're a bit over time, but I'll give the last word to Jackie to close uh, the session, uh, wrap it up, uh, and maybe something about next steps. I don't know. Over Thanks. Thanks, Henrik. Well, first of all, again, we really appreciate BREF support for this incredible uh, initiative and opportunity to network with everyone, including everyone who came here today and took their time to listen and participate. I just really want to thank you all. Um, next steps is, well, we are going to really be ramping up this research and this engaged approach. And as Andrea mentioned, with the facilitation of GMPT and World Resource Institute and Columbia University, we'll be holding many public events. But we've already got inquiries. So, so keep keep in touch. So as if you've signed up, you will get a notification in the new year about some of our upcoming public facing events. And the idea is that we learn together and we share as we go along, because frankly, we need to accelerate our action. That is very clear. Um, and so rather than waiting to the end and publishing, we're really going to be continually engaging and working with all of you. And in fact, we're also very interested in affiliate labs. If you want to set up something somewhere, um, you know, trying to learn from what we're doing and, and, and then participate, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to us. So again, just thank you to everyone and also the amazing um, team that has been assembled under this initiative. It's really an honor and privilege um, to be part of this. And uh, thank you all for your patience. Uh, sorry for going over time, but we will be in touch. This is just the launch. We'll have many more opportunities to ha have more interaction. So yeah. So do we have time for everyone to turn on their uh, video so we can all wave and say goodbye? And uh, that's part of our social tradition here after all. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> And also from Ray Area, I want to add to Henrik's word that we really thank all the presenters and uh, everyone participating in this program for such really interesting presentation. Thank you so much again. Roger, did you want to say something or are you just waving? <laughs> <laughs> You're just waving, okay. <laughs> did you tell you waving? <laughs> okay, <laughs> bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.